everyone to our webinar. Our clients are asking. I know we had a lot of tough competition today as the weather is about 70 degrees in Chicago. So uh, we're going to give you a lot of great information, but we promise we will let you out and you can enjoy the rest of the afternoon or the early evening. Uh, my name is Sherry greco Rikus, and I am co-founder and chief growth officer of Rappaport Rikus Capital Management. And I'm here with my partner, Dave Rappaport, who is co-founder and chief investment officer. Uh, we love to host these webinars because it gives us a chance to really share what we're thinking to our friends, colleagues, and clients, especially about the current market and what a ride we've had the last couple of years about the current market. So today, uh, Dave is going to provide you some valuable insights to help navigate these choppy waters of today's current financial markets. But before we could dive into it, I just wanted to say a big, big thank you uh, to all of you listening, especially our clients and our friends and colleagues. Uh, we started the firm 18 years ago. We're actually going to have our 19th anniversary, and we manage $960 million. Um, to be exact, I do watch this every day. It's about $961.4 million, um, and we're very proud, and thank you for all your confidence. Uh, as when we started the firm, we are fiduciaries, independent investment advisory firm, which means we always act in our clients' best interests. Uh, we currently have 14 employees, soon to be 16, and we have 450 client relationships. So again, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, when we started the firm, it was all about maximizing returns for our clients, and that's performance returns on investments. But over the past few years, we quickly learned that there was more. We call it the maximize your return on life solution. Yes, we're gonna maximize your returns on investments, but we wanna maximize your return on life. And it's a five prong solution. The first is we have a CFO checklist that we work with all our clients, about 15 pages to help our clients get organized. Everything from estate planning to taxes, to insurance, to social security, to Medicare, the list goes on and on. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is incorporating values as part of the discussion. As my dad used to say, you can have anything you want, not everything. So pick what's most important and that's your values. Of course, we do comprehensive planning, a 40 page financial plan, and we use an approach called value added indexing. It's track at market indexes that we buy in all different areas of the market for our clients. It provides a smooth ride. We can show performance. It ends up being low cost and less taxes. But we don't just put these plans on the shelf and forget about it. We continually meet with our clients to monitor, update as life changes and just give them updates on where they're at financially and as far as their uh, CFO checklist. So for some of you, the Maximize Your Return on Life might sound a little familiar. Uh, a couple years ago, I wrote a book and you can see a copy here. I looked at the list of who's attending. I think most of you have the book, but if you'd like a copy, uh, please put your name in the chat and we'll make sure that you get a copy. I didn't tell Dave I was going to offer these books. So Dave, I hope that's, that's okay with you. He's the CIO, not the CFO. So the books are fine. Sherry, uh, there is a rumor you are working on your second book. Is that true? Yeah, I'm working on my second book and it's going to be a book for women called uh, Good Friends, Good Finances. Why the same skills, women build friendships, make them su successful um, with their finances. I have to fine tune the title, but it's going to be along those lines, but a book for women. So um, men can read it too. There's going to be a lot of valuable uh, information. Um, I also uh, started a podcast with the same name, Maximize Your Return on Life, where I interview real people with real stories who use their values to make life's decisions. So uh, you're welcome uh, to go to rrcapital.com for more information about our Maximize Your Return on Life solution, the book, and the podcast. But let's get started for what we're really here today is the questions that clients are asking. And probably the question we get most often, and we do get it a lot, is we're at all market highs today. Is it a good time to invest? So Dave, I'm gonna turn it right. over to you. I, I will dive in. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, and before we talk about, is it a good time to invest in today's market? I think it makes sense to take a step back and talk about 
how we got to where we are today, what's happened over the last couple of years. And through so much of the last couple of years, uh, investors have been fixated on two things, the Federal Reserve and inflation. So I want to go back and take a look at this chart, uh, which covers the Fed's interest rate hikes from 2022 to 2024. So we'll go back to the this very top line, March of 2022. Uh, the Fed started increasing interest rates, and it became apparent as we were coming out of COVID uh, that the economy was uh, going to start heating up, but also inflation was coming in at very high levels at you know six, seven, eight, ultimately nine percent, uh, forty-year highs. And the Fed realized, hey, we better try to cool things down, try to cool the inflation rate down, and they started raising uh, interest rates and. Uh, you can see in 2022, they started with a quarter of a percent. They quickly went to a half a percent. And then June, July, and September, each of those three Fed meetings, they raised rates three quarters of a percent. They continued. Uh, and by the end of 2022, uh, interest rates had reached about four and a half percent. And uh, as a result of rates rising so quickly, bond returns were terrible in 2022 and stock returns also were lousy. So a very, very difficult year. And that leads to the beginning of 2023. And it became clear uh, that the Fed was not done yet. They continued to raise rates in February, March, May, and July. And for the most part, last year, the beginning of the year, stocks absorbed these rate hikes pretty well. But sentiment changed during the summer and the Fed uh, investors became concerned that the Fed was not going to cut rates. They were going to continue to keep rates very high for a long period of time. And so we had this sell-off late last year. You may remember stocks were down uh, 10% through August through October, and investors were pretty pessimistic. Um, I so think Dave, that... this, uh, this yeah, was a pretty record increase, wasn't it? All these increases yeah. happening so fast? We've never seen interest rates go up that quickly and to such a degree, uh, kind of in the history that we've been tracking these kind of things. And there's this phrase that we've been hearing a lot, higher for longer. Uh, a lot of people thought inflation was here to stay, that interest rates were going to keep rising. Can you give a little information on that? Yeah, that was the mood. I mean, that was what most people thought uh, last summer. We were, going, we were going to have high inflation and as a result, high interest rates for a very long period of time. And uh, as a result, uh, investors were fairly pessimistic. And that's why we had the big sell-off uh, in the fall of last year. But then uh, as the inflation number started coming in uh, in the fall, later in the fall, uh, the inflation number started looking better. And at the same time, the economy continued to perform pretty well. And in November, the Fed came out and kind of a surprise move, they pivoted. They basically came out and said, hey, you know, we're done raising rates for the time being. We feel that inflation is on a path towards 2%. And if this continues, Sometime in 2024, we may actually start cutting rates. And that was kind of a surprise to a lot of investors. And that created this big rally towards the end of the year, both for stocks and bonds. And uh, in November, U.S. stocks were up almost 10%, another 5% uh, in December, because investors started looking at the climate and they saw a bunch of good news. They saw the Fed had room to cut rates in the future, and that's usually pretty helpful for stocks. Inflation seemed to be getting under control, kind of still in the 3% range, but heading lower. Uh, the economy remained strong, continued growth, and really low unemployment. Corporate profits continued to come in strong and in many cases beat expectations. And, and there was something else going on that a lot of investors got really excited about, and that is artificial intelligence or AI. So that was a big, big news story in 2023. And breakthroughs in artificial intelligence became headline news, and investors wanted to own the companies that were directly involved. And many of them are in this group of companies, the, the biggest tech companies in the world that we call the Magnificent Seven. We're going to talk a little bit more about those. But investors also saw benefits for all companies. They thought that AI could potentially lead to an era of increased 
productivity, increased innovation, and that would benefit the economy as a whole and all companies. So you, you add all of that together, and it really was kind of like a Goldilocks environment. And that's why 2023 ended so strong. U.S. stocks were up about 26%, international stocks up uh, maybe 18%. And we had this big rally in bonds also at the end of the year and bonds returned over five and a half percent. So a really strong 2023 and that continued again into 2024. Yeah. And I, you know, when you talk about those returns, there was a lot in the media and we heard it a lot from clients is I can get 5% on my cash. Why? Do, that's a sure thing. Why should I do that? Why should I invest in bonds or stocks and cash ended up being the lowest performer um, so that brings me to the question that we started with, and thanks for this explanation here, is if I have cash, is it a good time to invest? Yeah, so we're, we're right at an all-time high in the markets. I think the s and is up another maybe 6% six, six or so this year. And so, um, you know, that's a question that comes up a lot with the markets up so much at an all-time high. Is it a good time to continue to put money to work? And I always remind our clients one of our core investing principles is we don't try to time uh, the market. Um, but we do want to take a look at how markets have done after they've hit all-time highs. So I have another chart here. And this looks at the U.S. stock market, the S&P 500, going back from 1926 to 2023. And you could see there are some uh, green bars and there are some gold bars. And the green bars represent how the market did one year later, three years later, and five years later, after months that ended at an all-time high. And you could see markets did pretty well after those months that they ended at an all-time high. Uh, one year later, up almost 14%. Three years, about 10 and a half. Five years later, also 10% annualized returns. The gold bars show how the market did if you would have invested at all of the month ends. And all I'd want you to take away from this chart is that the green and the gold are pretty similar. The returns, whether you invested at an all-time high or any other month, pretty similar. But that kind of makes sense because stocks go up over time. And as a matter of fact, about three in 10 months end up being at an all-time high. Uh, so we're not afraid of all-time highs. It's part of the investing experience. And uh, we certainly would continue to put money to work for clients, even though uh, stocks are doing so well. Thanks, Dave. And if, you know, clients, if you're fortunate enough to have received a bonus or you have some cash that you've been holding on for a while, uh, one strategy that works very well is called dollar cost averaging. And that's putting small amounts into the markets over time because volatility has been very high. And, you you know, we work with clients on a disciplined approach, but the key is, is to get in the market, especially if you're not going to need this money for five to seven plus years. So, Dave, we've been hearing on the news a lot about the Magnificent Seven. So can we talk a little bit about that and their impact on the market? Yeah, it, it seems like the, these are the companies that that's all anybody wants to talk about. Uh, these are the seven stocks, uh, the Magnificent Seven, you're probably familiar with all of the names, and they've done really well. And if you add up their combined valuations, these seven companies represent about a quarter of the value of the US stock market. They're some of the most successful companies in the world, and they're some of the most profitable companies in the world. And by and large, the performance of these companies right now is driving the performance of the U.S. stock market. And in 2023, uh, these seven companies were up over 100%. But remember, by and large, they're tech stocks. The group can be quite volatile. In the prior year, 2022, the same group was down 50%, much worse than the market uh, as a whole. And Dave, is it unusual to have a small number of stocks represent 20 to 30 percent of the overall market? Yeah, we see it a, a lot. So um, we looked at the last 35 years and we said, what's the average weight of the top 10 biggest companies in the market? And it's averaged about 20 percent. 
so quite a bit, but today it's closer to uh, 30%. So just for our clients that are on uh, the webinar here, you do own these stocks because we yeah. own full market indexes and we track the market, but you do own these stocks yeah, in absolutely. a decent percentage. So don't think you're not participating with these stocks. Yeah. So, I mean, Sherry, as, as you said, our portfolios track the markets closely. And so you, as, as you'd expect, these are the largest stocks in the market and they're the largest holdings albeit in very diversified portfolios. Okay, Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are these seven stocks going to continue to have the growth that they've had? What's your opinion yeah. on that? Um, yeah, so my crystal ball is as good as anybody else's. Uh, we don't really know. But again, we're going to take a look at history and kind of what happens to companies as they get very big and they reach kind of the top 10 uh, in the market and what happens afterwards. So we've got a chart here. Again, we've got some green bars on the left and some gold bars on the right. And the green bars represent uh, how the 10 largest companies did uh, in terms of outperforming the market prior to joining that top 10 list. And you could see in the, you know, all the way to the left in the 10 years before joining this elite group, Companies did very well. They outperformed the market by 12%. And then five years before joining the 10 largest companies, they outperformed by 20%. And then in the three years before, they outperformed by 27%. So on the way up to becoming among the 10 largest companies, very, very strong performance. Uh, but then they join this group. And then the next several years going forward, not as good. And you could see three years after this uh, is the gold bar outperforming by a little bit, six tenths of a percent, and then actually underperforming nine tenths of a percent and um, one and a half percent 10 years later. And this kind of tracks, you know, U.S. companies going all the way back to 1927. So, you know, the lesson remains, uh, trees don't grow to the sky. And just because companies have done very well looking backwards doesn't necessarily mean that that performance uh, is going to continue. I'm glad that we own them in our diversified portfolios, uh, but we don't know if the, the trends will continue. Yeah, this was really enlightening when you showed me this the other day. And it's, you know, people think things will last forever and we all know they don't. So you do own these in your portfolio, but it's not the only stocks that you own. So another question, Dave, that we um, get asked a lot is, you know, with 5% return in money markets, should clients still own bonds? Yeah. So that's a, a, a really good question, Sherry. And uh, the answer is yes. You know, um, we look at last year and bonds uh, did quite well with the rally that we had towards the end of the year. Um, it's possible uh, that the Fed will cut rates at some point in uh, 2024. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but our answer is to be uh, broadly diversified. Um, I do want to bring up one point, Cherry, and, and we're talking about uh, these magnificent seven tech stocks. And again, so much of what has driven their performance has been investors getting really excited about the potential for artificial intelligence. So I, I got a little bit kind of worried about this because I want to know, is artificial intelligence going to put me out of a job and maybe we'll have a computer uh, be the chief uh, investment officer? So, you know, the question is really, will, out, will artificial intelligence, picking stocks using computers, uh, outperform our approach? And I thought it'd be a fun question to ask artificial intelligence. So I went on ChatGPT. And you familiar with ChatGPT? It's kind of search search engine yeah. driven by artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, and I said, so you will, asked artificial uh, intelligence about artificial exactly. intelligence. Okay. Will AI <laughs> outperform the market? You could see my question, and I'm not, but believe me, I'm not going to read all of this uh, to you. Uh, but a couple of the highlights: uh, AI itself said AI. Not all AI models are equally effective. It can be challenging for AI models to uh, identify mispriced stocks. Uh, it can be uh, harder for any 
single AI model to consistently outperform. Uh, and AI models may be prone to biases or errors. So Sherry, AI itself is saying I still might have a job at least over yeah, the next. Yeah, Dave, I know you've been uh, losing sleep over years. this, but you know we asked AI about AI, and if you read the bottom, the risk management, uh, biases, errors, unexpected outcomes. None of that happens with with Dave as our CIO. So you know there are <laughs> there you. can be some unexpected, but. But we yeah. do the best to smooth out the ride for our clients. Yeah. So, um, sure, you you did ask you know about cash, and I do want to get back because yeah. I, th I think that's an important. Uh, I question. do skip around a lot, and you work <laughs> with me long enough to know that. So okay. let's let's get to cash. Okay. Yeah. So you know, every time the Federal Reserve meets, uh, they decide: are they going to hold rates steady? Are they going to increase rates? Or are they they going to decrease? Uh, rates, but they also forecast what they expect to do in future meetings. And at their January 2024 meeting, they forecasted that later this year, they would end up making three quarter point cuts uh, before the end of the year, which would bring the, the Fed funds rate or kind of the rate on, on, on cash down to about four and a half, four point six percent 4.6%. So that's what they're predicting. You know, a lot of market participants think that they're going to get even more aggressive, cut more. Some say, you know, maybe that's even too optimistic. They won't cut as much, but the Fed's going to continue to watch uh, the inflation rate. They're going to continue to watch how the economy is growing. But most investors are predicting that the Fed will start cutting rates later this year. So the likelihood is that we won't see this beautiful 5% return uh, on cash. But we'd still be inclined to say that, you know, as long as rates are kind of still north of 4%, that's not bad. That's still pretty good. And you always you have to remember, we're coming off more than a decade when there was basically no return on cash. So even if rates do come down a little bit, we still think that returns on cash should still be pretty good. Yeah, I think we'd all be pretty happy at 4%. But just to add, because um, we do talk to a lot of clients, and if the listeners on the webinar here, if you do have large sums of cash at a bank, double check what you're earning on that, because I've seen as low as you know 0.10 or half a percent, and there is a lot of options to earn 4 or 5% on your money. So just double check what you're earning um, at the banks, because it's important, and you might as well earn as much as you can. So um, you're you're talking a lot about possibly lower yields. Is that a good thing for the stock market, Dave? Yeah. So I, Sherry, the the risk is every time you ask a question like that, I say I don't know. It's difficult uh, to predict. But we are again going to take a look at uh, history. So you're probably looking. Well, at you've this always chart. taught me, Dave. We <laughs> we take the best information we can, the Absolutely. research we can, yeah. and make the best decisions we can. So that's all we can offer. Yeah. Uh, so here we have a chart, and uh, you're probably looking at it and thinking, well, that looks like a bunch of red dots. Uh, but let me explain what the, the chart shows. And on the bottom axis, that is the horizontal axis, we're looking at yields on three-month treasury bills. So that's a kind of a proxy for yields on cash. And this goes back to 1955. And you could see yields on cash ranged uh, all the way from zero to over 14%, which we saw in the early 1980s. And then you look at the vertical axis and you see the corresponding stock returns when yields were at different uh, levels. So Sherry, let me start uh, by asking you, can you see a pattern there? You showed me this, I tried. I don't see a pattern, but I do see some elephant ears and a little trunk, but that's all I can make out of these dots. Okay, I am I am looking for that. I don't see I'll it. show you that later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, the point is it's random. There, there's no pattern. We've had high stock returns when yields are low. We've had high stock returns when yields are high and and vice versa. So, you know, historically, the level of interest rates isn't a useful tool in predicting uh, how stocks will do. Okay. So let me switch gears. Uh, we're entering uh, elections, presidential elections, and I do not want you to get political here, but how will these elections affect the stock market? Yeah, we get this question uh, all the time and everybody brings to us, you know, kind of their political leanings. And again, we're, we're just going to 
look at history without kind of uh, getting political in one way or another. But it's an interesting uh, chart we have here. We have all of the presidents uh, going back to 1926 uh, listed on the bottom. And uh, the red, uh, if they're Republican, the blue, if they're Democrat. And I think the takeaway here is the markets have done quite well, regardless of who is in the White House. And I looked at the pictures and I was able to name all the presidents going back to 1933. I kind of got stuck on 1929 and 1926. I looked that up, Dave Hoover. Good job. Okay. I knew you were going to ask. So it doesn't matter uh, that much one way or the other. The markets uh, have tended to do well under uh, Democrats or Republicans as president. And then we looked at kind of correspondingly, what about Congress? You know, who controls uh, Congress? And uh, we have, again, red if the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate, blue if the Democrats controlled both, and the purple here is if it's mixed control. And the same uh, result here, stocks over time have uh, gone higher regardless of political uh, control. So we just simply don't make decisions on the basis of who we may think will win an election or um, whoever has won what we think that potentially what that means for legislation uh, and the markets as a whole. It's really, again, a very long term approach. And I like to add, when you look at these charts and the one with the presidents, it's not a straight line up. There's peaks and valleys and you have to have long-term mentality and you'll see that's one of our core principles so you know speaking of long term uh where do you see uh stocks and bonds you know long term from now yeah so you know we always say who knows the, over the next three months or six months in the short run uh but we do like to think what uh returns might be over the next 10 years or so and to answer that question we often look to one of our money management partners we look to vanguard uh, because they continually put out long-term kind of 10-year uh, projections. So here are Vanguard's long-term projections. Uh, if you look at uh, on the left for U.S. stocks or non-U.S. stocks, for U.S. bonds and for non-U.S. bonds, and there's uh, a, you know a bunch of bars, all different shades of green, and we're just going to focus on the dark green because those are Vanguard's predictions uh, at the end of 2023. Uh, the other bars are for at the end of 2022 and the end of 2021. But looking at the dark green, Vanguard's predicting U.S. stock returns over the next 10 years in a range of 4.2 to 6.2 percent. And, you know, that's lower than certainly we've seen over the last uh, 10 years or so and certainly lower uh, than uh, what historical returns have been. And one of the reasons is that U.S. stocks to begin with today are pretty expensive and high valuations often lead to lower returns uh, in the future. But then you look at their outlook for international stocks, and that's here a higher outlook, 7.1% to 9.1%. And the reason is very, the reasoning's uh, similar, but kind of flipped. International stocks are trading at much, much cheaper valuations relative to US. Stock. So we look at a projection like this, and our response is, is pretty straightforward. Own them both. So the bulk of clients' stock allocation remains in the U.S., but we like to include a healthy piece outside the U.S. Uh, as well. Great, great. And I know you mentioned, you know, if you look at, it's been a long time since international has outperformed U.S., so uh, I think it's the valuations and we're ready for it. So you know, Dave, thanks for your perspective on everything. Um, sometimes questions lead to other questions, but I think there's a lot of research here and a lot of great insights, and a lot of them really fall into our core principles. So we'd like to share that with you today. Uh, Dave and I, back in 2005, when we started the firm, one of our first projects with a blank sheet of paper was to come up with what we believe is our core investing principles. And these have not changed in almost 19 years. But the first one is your asset allocation. That's your mix of stocks and bonds. And that will really determine your success. So working with an advisor to come up with an asset allocation that is right for you based on your risk tolerance, your time horizon, your liquidity needs is very important. You could have 
the best stack that is only down 20% when the market's down 30%, but that's not helping to achieve your goals. You need to have an investment plan and an asset allocation. The second, which I think you heard mentioned many a time, is long-term thinking, not short. We're not going to get in and out of the market based on a war that's going on or interest rates rising or falling. Uh, we're long-term, but what we do is we rebalance. So when we come up with an asset allocation and you're ever 5% out of balance, so you're at 60%, you start to creep up to 66% stocks, we rebalance halfway back, which means we would sell 3% of the stocks and buy bonds. So we're always selling high and buying low. And that's our way uh, to keep portfolios optimized and with their investment plan. One of the things that you can control the most is taxes and costs. And we always say it's what you earn after tax, taxes and costs. And so our philosophy is we use um, very low cost ETFs and mutual funds, basically market tracking index or passive. And they also have very low taxes. So just you know, look at what you're paying for individual mutual funds or money managers, as well as what the what's called turnover, how many times stocks are sold, which could generate capital gains. I think we've made it clear from a lot of the slides here that diversification is so important. And you shouldn't just be in the S&P 500. You should be in the total US market, the international market, the emerging market, international bonds, real estate, treasury inflation, protected securities, um, and the list goes on, small cap, mid cap, large cap. But really being diversified is the way you can enhance returns and reduce risk. And the last principle that we were kind of an outlier back in 2005, it was the heyday of the hedge funds, but let the markets work for you. So own the markets, own the haystacks. Don't try to find you know, the needle in the haystack. Try to find the next NVIDIA because that's uh, it, we have a lot of research, and I know Dave would love to share it with all of you, how stock picking um, doesn't work. So this is our core principles, and I think it's aligned with a lot of what Dave said today. Yeah. Um, Sherry, so um, I'd like you now to answer the next question. And I know this is something that you talk quite a bit about and write quite a, a bit about as well. Uh, here's the question. What is the best investment you can make? You know, I, I believe in the passive approach, but I'm starting to think Apple might be pretty good. Uh, no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Dave. Don't fall off your chair. Um, again, I believe in in diversified um, market tracking uh, portfolios, but really the best investment you can make, and you'll see this in my writing in my book, is to invest in yourself. Yeah. And right now, I think it's your health. We can help manage your wealth. We can help manage your financial planning, but you need to invest in yourself and it's your health. And if there's been a doctor's appointment you've been postponing, make it. I had a friend recently that wasn't feeling great and I kept encouraging, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And he went to the doctor, had a minor heart issue. It was easily corrected um, with some medication, but it could have turned into a life altering situation. And so um, make those doctor's appointments. I know a lot of them are not fun, but make them because um, your health is just as important as your wealth. So that's how I like to end it today. But I wanted to um, thank you all for coming. And I know a lot of you may still have a lot of questions. And so we have our web, uh, our email addresses on here. If they're really, really hard questions, D Rappaport at hey. our, our capital .com. If you want to talk about values, come to me, but I can answer the tough ones too. But um, again, we want to thank you for joining us. I know our competition was a beautiful day outside, um, but we hope you learned a little bit and we're always happy to help you. Please visit our website at rrcapital.com. And for our clients that are on, I know a lot of you are on here. Thank you for your support and your confidence in us and to all the client uh, colleagues and friends that have helped us get to 960 million. Uh, we're continuing to grow and thank you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.